I expect them to probably try to hold uh, rates uh, in this kind of band for a period of time. They could still get a couple 25 basis point uh, increases potentially. But I think that right now they're going to see as their as their lagged effects start to impact the market. So like I said before, the public uh, deficit sector, like the public debt financing still hasn't fully financed at these higher rates. Busy over as more and more debt finances year after year after year, you would start to uh, move towards a much higher average interest rate. And the same is true when you look at the corporate sector, when you look at the, the you know, bank lending sector to uh, commercial real estate or other sources, a lot of this still has to refinance at the higher rate. So merely by staying at the levels that they currently are, they'd still effectively be tightening. And so I think that's that's the approach that they seem to be signaling that they're going to do uh, for at least a couple of quarters now. So I think we see a very bifurcated market. I mean, outside of the, the top seven stocks, um, a lot of them are actually pretty inexpensive and non-performing this year. Um, and so I don't have a lot of concern about the, the necessarily the broader market, but certainly the areas that have been over um, bought uh, and that are mostly, well, not was we haven't really seen earnings expansion for, to a significant degree. Instead, we mostly saw valuation expansion. And I think that part of the market, those like, you know, high valued, large cap tech stocks, that's where there's significant downside risk. And I think that if we enter this, if the market starts to see that we're entering kind of a renewed period of maybe minor inflation. So if energy prices stop going down, stop giving us those offsets compared to some of the other things. And if we have the ongoing background kind of large structural fiscal deficits, you could have this period where the market comes to term with these higher interest rates and then has to re-rate some of these you know, highly valued equities to, to match that. And I think that's that's the negative thing for the market. So sometimes when you have a higher period of inflation, um, you get equities that don't necessarily do well in real terms, but they hold up better than you might expect in nominal terms. You know, for example, if you look at emerging market recession, often the stock market in local currency terms doesn't look like a recession. It's often going flat to up in that type of environment. But of course, that's a pretty extreme environment because you have, you know, usually substantial emerging market level inflation along with that recession. So if we had a, a type of inflation that's more stagflationary and we still have kind of ongoing background nominal numbers that are decent, even as the real numbers are negative, that's you could have an environment where the equity market maybe doesn't do as badly as we think it does, or at least certain parts of the market. Another way to look at it is that, for example, during the dot-com bust, you know, the, the NASDAQ came down tremendously, but if you were looking at, say, healthcare stocks or REITs or, you know, the price of oil or energy producers, there was a lot less drama in those parts of the, you know, the market or pricing around that area compared to what we look at when we see the major indices. So I think it'll be it'll be somewhat sector specific. And I think that much of the negative kind of risk to the market is more in real terms than in necessarily nominal terms. But you can still have easily a 10, 20 percent drawdown. Those are those are normal. So I'm still reasonably constructive on energy. Um, uh, when I look at the, the full healthcare sector, um, you have to be careful with certain regulatory risks, but overall that's a reasonably priced uh, value oriented sector at the moment, as well as I think, I think things like T-bills are attractive in this environment. Um, you don't have to be fully invested in the equity market. And I'm still bullish long-term on gold and Bitcoin at these levels. So I think it, it'll be somewhat affected. I just think that basically the, the price is already almost like at recessionary levels. So part of why we've been able to push oil down as far as we have is because we, we purposely brought on, you know, in some sense, artificial supply while curtailing demand to a significant degree. You know, we've had a many basically borderline manufacturing recession, um, kind of slowdowns in certain areas. And so that combination of demand moderation and supply side improvements have already, I think, the energy sector kind of looks like a recession. But I think that it could hold up better than we think over the next, say, 12 months. And then whenever we emerge from that recession, like when we move forward to the next period of growth, I think the issue there is that without a CapEx cycle, so there, if there's not a lot of new supply coming online uh, in like an investable time horizon, then I think that, you know, until we have that happen, that the supply side is just going to get tighter and tighter and tighter. And that most of the oil companies, when you look at them right now, there's still prices, though, these these prices are kind of locked in indefinitely. And, and you know, even if even if oil would have dropped to 70 or 60 and, and places like that, the large caps are still relatively priced for that scenario. So I think the downside risk is somewhat moderate, whereas the upside potential over, say, a five year period is pretty significant. So I think it, it's funny. So those of us in developed countries, uh, you know, we see these kind of 
mild upticks in inflation, so high single digit inflation, you know, that that's kind of our biggest worry. I think that the the biggest challenge is for, you know, the majority of the world that lives in developing countries, um, because they have the situation where their their political leaders have to effectively manage two currencies, right? So they're managing their own local currency and then they're also managing their relationship with the dollar. You know, the the their a lot of times their debts are denominated in dollars, their inputs, you know, their um uh, you know, imports and exports are often dollar denominated. And so they're managing those two types of currency situations. So for example, if you were living in Egypt over the past, say two years, you just got your currency cut in half relative to the dollar. And so all of your savings and your ongoing wages are devalued. All right, so that's that's kind of an example of where it impacts people in the real world. For those of us in the, in the developed market, we only experience it around the margins. You know, in this recent period, I think, and we're gonna have further kind of rounds of this, periods of inflation affect us, as well as when you try to send, for example, money globally, I think, you know, we get an appreciation for how inefficient the current system is, because within any one country, it's it's fairly easy to send money. But when you start sending money between borders, you start running into how antiquated some of the actual systems are behind the scenes. We're kind of relying on, you know, multi-decade old correspondent bank hops if you're trying to send money uh, internationally. And I think a lot of that is just due for an overhaul. The way that I kind of end the book is is looking at two potential paths. So one is obviously central bank digital currencies. So as they try to modernize their back end of their system, they can potentially fix some of these inefficiencies. The obviously the challenge there is that there's obviously privacy issues, control issues, and other risks around that. So instead, I generally have a more favorable view towards open source type of solutions. So things like Bitcoin, um, as as the world, I think, gets more digital, as money gets more digital, if the open source types of monies win, I think that can reduce a lot of these frictions. But of course, the markets for those are still very small. So I think until they're much larger, we're not really going to see a lot of the benefits for the global system. I think in this case, the solution comes down to individuals. You have to find assets that are not being devalued. Um, and so I think that over time, the, the history of money, especially, you know, when I when I went kind of hold the whole background of the book to see how money evolved over time, generally it's a problem that works itself out somewhat organically. So as as money start breaking down, people gravitate towards other types of monies. Um, and I think that that's what solves it over time. But again, these are when you look at those transact those like transitions in, in, in the past, they might seem quickly, but then when you look at the actual dates, it's usually a multi-decade process. And so I think the same thing's gonna apply to us now, where you know, right now individuals can protect themselves by owning the right types of assets. Um, but basically until you have a critical mass of whole generations really emphasizing those types of assets, I think the structural system itself, you know, is gonna be with us for a while, which is this this more inflationary kind of backdrop. 